What's up, my podcast listeners? This is your host, Rafael Matuszewski. And no, I am not at home. I am not in the gym. I am currently in Seattle in my hotel room. And I needed to get this episode done, you know? This is how you crush it, as I say. Um, Today's topic, we are going to go over the back squat. So I've done so many different episodes on this topic, and I've picked four, I believe. Four or three. Three episodes. Ooh, yeah, three episodes. This is like looking over my notes. Three episodes and a tutorial. So I look at, you know, what you need in a back squat. There's a lot of stuff. Um, I also look at foot position. And then there is an entire episode on how to fix your back squat. And then at the very end, like I had mentioned before, we're going to go into a full um, barbell back squat tutorial. And I'm going to say this right now. You don't have to back squat. Um, I, I just find in this in our industry, um, there's a lot of people um, that are kind of just like, I'm this thing only, or I'm this thing only, or I'm this thing only. And then there's these like th- those little categories. But in those three categories, maybe the category over here could use some stuff from this category and vice versa. And then instead of having these kind of dogmatic sections of people in the fitness industry, they could just like broaden their horizons and just open up. And now it's like maybe they can get their clients or themselves to their goal faster, you know? I personally don't back squat. Um, It's just kind of a personal choice. Uh, It's one of those things where I've been in this industry for a long time and, you know, learning from people like Mike Boyle who have been in this industry forever, like 30 years, that's a lot of experience. So when someone like him says, you know, I don't back squat with my athletes or general population because of X, Y, and Z, and it makes really good sense to me, then I go, okay, maybe I don't need to back squat. Because at the end of the day, what is my goal? What is your goal? If your goal is to be better at the back squat, then yes, you should back squat. If your goal is to get stronger in your legs. There's so many other things that you could be doing um, instead of the back squat. Now, a lot of times in my industry, when people say these things where it's like, you know, you shouldn't back squat, you should do this instead. They also need to understand that, you know, where I come from, my background, from the rehab side of things, Again, I work with chiropractors, physios, RMTs, uh, naturopathic doctors, medical doctors that all have exercise backgrounds. They themselves lift. They themselves follow the same people I follow in the industry. So when I see, because I still see patients where, you know, some are really general population have never touched a dumbbell in their life, to CrossFitters, to powerlifters, to weekend warriors to people that are gym goers, but still live a general population life. And I've seen things like back squats royally fuck up their shit. So at the end of the day, it's like, to me, I'm like, if I'm constantly seeing this, it's not just like one patient comes in, they're like, oh, when I was back squatting, like this thing started hurting. It wasn't just one person. In a month, we'll get like three or four people and I've been working at the specific clinic for four years. So it's a reoccurring theme constantly. And what do I do instead is if someone's kind of really married to this idea of back squatting, then we're going to look at things like the front squat instead or a barbell split squat. Things tend to fix themselves when you just do that simple thing. You know, I've only had two situations where someone had to barbell back squat because of their sport. So then that's just like, okay, I need to make sure that every time you back squat, we have a protocol to follow after to make sure you can back squat again. You know, it really comes down to goals. What do you want to achieve? 
And all right, so I got my video cut. Um, so it comes down to your goals and what you want to achieve. And a lot of times you need to ask yourself, why am I so married to this specific exercise? A lot of times, you know, it's just what you've read, what you've seen online, or someone's influenced you that you need to back squat no matter what, which is kind of silly to me. People need to understand that when there is an absolute in the fitness industry, you need to be kind of like wary, like, oh shit, maybe this is not the best thing. You know, you need to kind of think outside the box. There's so many different schools of thought when it comes to training. And I think like to really understand how to improve a human being, you need to be able to experience all different forms of opinions on training and then formulate your own. Because it's like, why not grab some of this stuff and this stuff and stuff down here and mesh it together that works for you. You know, I've been in this industry for 12 years and I've seen a lot, I've learned a lot, and everyone has a different method, but they all end up at the same point. So you could probably get there faster if you kind of just pick and choose little things. But um, I'm gonna stop rambling because I could probably do a whole hour on just the back squat itself, just chatting around, but um, I'm gonna let you get into my previous videos that I've done in the past on everything back squat and finish off strong with a tutorial on how to do it. And hopefully this is um, beneficial to you guys and is, you know, you'll learn a thing or two and maybe you're gonna end up back squatting more because you're like, you know what? I really fucking love the back squat and that's gonna be my thing. Or you're gonna be like, um, you know what? Maybe I should lay off it and do something else. So without further ado, here is three episodes that I've recorded previously and a tutorial. Here we go. What's up, podcast listeners? It's your host, Rafael Matuszewski, and this is another edition of the podcast in my car. And before I start driving, I need to do my shout outs because I keep forgetting. So my new number one, all the way in Kentucky, in the States, a city named Bowling Green. Number two is Portland, Oregon. Number three is Martinez, California. And I said California, weird. That shit happens to me all the time. Um, and then number four, I'm gonna do top five. Number four, city of Bloomsburg out in Pennsylvania. And number five, the villages in Florida. Shout out to everyone in the States listening to my show. Freaking awesome. I love it, and let's get this episode going because I am pumped to talk about squats. So I probably brought up the whole topic of squats maybe a year ago, probably a year ago, and I need to revisit it because... A lot of times when people start listening to my show, they don't go as far as, you know, the episode they see that was the last one. So this might be a review for some of you, but um, it's always good to revisit topics. So back squatting, let's start there. I personally don't have any clients that back squat because, and I remember posting about this like a year ago on my social media, that in order for a good looking back squat, you need to have a lot of prerequisites and 99% of the general population does not have that, pre, the prerequisites in order to back squat effectively. And I got a lot of shit from the powerlifting community that just, they just couldn't handle what I said. Um, but look at the average person, and I've brought this up so many times. It's rare that they have um, good enough mechanics and the mobility within each joint in order to squat effectively and then on top of that place a load on it. And even in the clinic when we get CrossFitters that 
you know, are pushing their bodies to the limit when it comes to squats and all that kind of fun stuff, they still get injured and they still have, you know, some issues. Like, not everyone is built to squat. Like, if you look at the literature of different uh, pelvises, there's different ways how your femur kind of sits into the acetabulum. Like, you, you can't fight your genetic makeup sometimes when you're trying to squat. So you have that in the very beginning. Secondly, if you are a general a general population person, you probably haven't deep squatted since you were a child. So now trying to get you into your depth, your deepest depth under load, shit is not going to look nice. <laughs> so when I look at back squatting, there's not really a place or time where I've ever put it in. Even for my own training, you know, maybe throughout the year I'll back squat once or twice, but it's not really been, you know, a goal of mine to back squat 300 or anything like that. So let me go over what's necessary in order to back squat effectively. One, which is a huge one, is enough hip mobility. Most people don't have it. Number two, enough thoracic extension in order to place the bar on your back and be in a somewhat upright position in order to squat effectively. Most people don't have that. Really good hip stabilizers. Most people don't have that. That's why when you see people back squat under a near maximal load, they'll usually shift over to one side and then come up. So it's kind of like the squiggly line and up, squiggly line and up. It's because they have a deficiency in one of their hips when it comes to stabilization. So then when it comes to squatting, the body is always going to go in the uh, the path of least resistance. So if it knows that it has a stronger hip, then it's going to go to that side. Now, next thing is adequate ankle mobility. People tend to have really shitty ankles. I've yet to meet a general population person. Uh, Let's scratch that. I would say six to seven out of the 10 times when I get a person in for an assessment, they have adequate ankles, right? Like it's not a lot, but it's not that bad. So we have that. The other thing that you need to back squat is enough shoulder external rotation. In order for your shoulder to get into an abducted position and then go into external rotation, a lot has to happen. So number one, your T-spine mobility for extension, which I mentioned earlier, plays a huge role in order for your shoulder to actually go into external rotation. So if you don't have enough spinal extension and you're throwing your glenohumeral humeral joint into <laughs> external rotation and the actual joint itself can't move, you're placing a shit ton of stress on that anterior shoulder. And a lot of people will complain of shoulder pain while back squatting. So those two and two go together. On top of that, in order for your shoulder to externally rotate, all the muscles involved for external rotation behind that shoulder blade need to work in harmony. Like those shoulder blades, all their movements are associated with about 17 or 18 muscles. I can't even remember anymore. So imagine if you had two or three muscles in the back there, not developed properly and developed. I mean, like they're an atrophy because you sit at a desk all fucking day. So now you're placing your shoulder blade in a weird position, maybe not even able to get there. You're placing your glenohumeral humeral joint into external rotation that can't even get there because your T-spine sucks. That's a lot of shit that you need to clear up in order to get that back squat looking pretty. Now, the other thing you need is really good core stability in order to stabilize your spine. If you've ever seen um, people back squat where they lose it and they kind of cave forward, Right? They didn't develop enough intra-abdominal pressure in order to stabilize their spine 
to drive that weight up against gravity. I see this all the time. People kind of just jitter around and then they just collapse, right? So working basic core stability in order to get there is huge, huge. I just don't understand why, you know, people skip steps and exercise all the time, right? So one, we have that. Most of the time, people don't even know how to utilize their diaphragm to create that intra-abdominal pressure. So there's another caveat that you need to understand when it comes to back squatting. All of this is required, and there's probably more. And I can get into like small details, like do you actually have enough tibial rotation, external rotation, to back squat? Probably not if your ankles and hips suck. Right? Like if your joint, like your hip joint, your knee joint, your ankle joint, your shoulder joint, and thoracic joint don't move the way that they're designed, you placing a barbell with weight on top of it, hoping for the best, is not going to work out well for you. Sure, you can get away with it, right? And I see this all the time in the clinic where people are pushing it hard in the gym. They're not so much injured. They just have some aches and pains, but they all kind of complain about the same thing, that their back squat's not going up, their deadlift's not going up, their bench press is not going up. And then I do an assessment or I already know their history and background. I'm like, well, yeah, you don't have X, Y, and Z. Pick whatever thing I already brought up into the back squat that's necessary. So I I tell them, like, you get to a certain point where you can cheat enough And then you hit a plateau. And the only way for you to get past that plateau is to clear up all the shit that I've already brought up in this talk. And then they get all like defensive that like, oh no, no, that's not it. Like I've been back squatting for years and it's like, yeah, but your numbers have not been going up. So what do you wanna do? And most of the time when they don't listen to me and they continue back squatting with shitty body mechanics, that's when they really get injured and then they're like oh my rib my rib is out and I'm putting air quotes or my back really like pulled on me and I couldn't walk for three days like that shit tends to happen when you don't have prerequisites down packed now what if someone really wanted to squat but at the same time could fix some things so this is where I like front squatting Not barbell front squatting, because that's a whole other story that you need. But placing a dumbbell in front of you, like a goblet position, is a great place to start. Because with an anterior load, your body physically can't cheat as much as a back squat. Right? You cheat with a goblet squat, you're going to end up just falling over. Now... A lot of people think, oh no, I'm not gonna go to a goblet squat because it's too easy. Guaranteed, the strongest guy in your gym, or if you think that's you, or woman, if I placed a dumbbell in front of you, that's 100 pounds. Say that's the heaviest one that you got, and you back squat 185, whatever the fuck it is. And I tell you to squat down four seconds eccentrically not just like one, two, three, four, or like four Mississippis down to your depth, wherever that is, and then tell you to hold it for one Mississippi at the bottom and then explode up as hard as possible and do that for eight reps, please tell me that's easy. I, I dare you telling me that's easy, right? Like it doesn't matter what, you know, tool you use to squat There's so many different ways to make it challenging, and a lot of it is just tempo, right? People are under under this impression that they have to have a barbell, they have to have X, Y, and Z, they have to have straps on their knees to, like, be strong. Like, fuck, get a 100-pound dumbbell and try to squat that thing the way I described. Or grab a dumbbell at 50% of your body weight and see if you can actually squat that 25 times. Probably it's going to be super challenging. And you're going to feel where you're weak. You're going to feel those like little spots where you get exposed really quickly where you need to work that shit out. That being said, 
if you want to challenge yourself even more, say you like you're listening to this, you're like, yeah, that makes sense, but I still feel like that's not going to help me. Take two dumbbells in a front rack position, but turn them into a supinated position. So you're almost like at the top of a bicep curl. Drive your elbows forward, so now the weight is in front of you, kind of hovering in front of your face, and now squat. I dare you to take like 30s or 35s and squat like that 12 times and tell me that that's not hard, right? Placing the load in front of you again makes it challenging, but now placing the load further away from your midline makes it really, really challenging. So that being said, back squatting takes a lot of prerequisites. I'm not saying stay away from it forever because it's the plague. I'm saying that right now, it's probably not going to work out for you. But if you do things to improve your mobility, improve your tissue quality, then yes, go back to the back squat. But right now, most likely, that back squat is not taking you to your goals. You need to work on the small things, the foundations that make the back squat happen. That's it for me. Hopefully you like this little rant tangent episode. Um, Let me know if you guys have any questions. Hit the show notes. Add me on Facebook, Instagram, that whole fun stuff. Give me a five-star review. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to the people all over the world listening to my show. That is super awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Until next time. Hello, everyone, podcast listeners, internet people. Welcome back to another episode of Cut the Shit, Get Fit. I am your lovely host, Rafael Machuszewski, and I got a motherfucking migraine today. Just terrible. Terrible. Here is a fun fact about my migraine journey. I have figured out that my migraines only happen on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays of the week. And only on days where the weather changes drastically. So today when I woke up, it was sunny. Then it went into this like dark and gloomy day where it looked like it was about to rain. And now it's bright sun. And again, my camera is being terrible. Um, So that being said, the only thing that fixes my migraines is sleep. So I'm hoping to go home and like take a 15 minute nap type of thing. Um, But regardless, you got to just move on, move on with your day. Um, Shout outs. Let's do this. I'm going to try to be as charismatic as possible while dealing with this bullshit in my head. Um, Number one, new city. All the way in the state of Ohio, a city called Harrison. Hopefully that's a place in there. Because again, I read that really quickly. But regardless, state of Ohio. Shout out to everyone in Ohio listening to my show. Um, Number two, Phoenix, Arizona. Shout out to everyone in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, And number three, all the way in the UK is the city of Aberdeen. Shout out to everyone in the UK listening to my show. That's super awesome. I love international um, listeners. Today, what we're going to talk about, and I might have multiple parts to this, but we're going to talk about our feet because they are integral to movement, everyday life, exercise especially. And it's a complex structure. And I remember reading that, I think it was Leonardo da Vinci saying that the human foot, specifically the arch, is the most sophisticated piece of our anatomy in our body. Because if that thing doesn't function properly, everything goes to shit. <laughs> Literally. And it's, and it's true. That's what usually happens. So... That being said, um, we're going to start with what our foot needs to do if we're doing an exercise, say like a squat, a lunge, or whatever it may be. 
So imagine you squatting. In order for it to look good, it starts from the ground up. So if you think about how you develop as a baby, you start on your back, you start moving your hands and legs and head, and eventually you transition over to rolling, you're now on your hands and knees, you're crawling, eventually you get into a split stance or a squat position, and then you come up from it. So really a squat starts from the bottom up, and it starts with our feet. And in a proper squat, when you start looking at how people place the pressure on their feet, it makes a huge difference. So I want you to imagine kind of a tripod position of your feet. So it starts with the heel, the big toe, and kind of the pinky toe. And to be more specific, kind of like the first toe, kind of where the joint is, is where the pressure should be. And then where your fifth toe is, where the joint is, like the metatarsal part, that big bony part, is the third piece to a perfect planted foot while squatting, single leg deadlifting, lunging, whatever have you decided to do that day for a leg exercise. I made an analogy of a... um, Harry Potter reference so if you met remember I think it's in let's go with the movies because not everyone has read the books I believe it's the Deathly Hallows part one if I have not mistaken where the Death Eaters are chasing Harry and Hagrid in his little motorcycle with the um, attachment that Harry's sitting in And I want you to think of how integral that piece of machinery is when it comes to driving. So it has kind of like three points of contact, right? Harry's little point of contact and then the two wheels of the motorcycle. So you have three wheels. And imagine if one of those wheels just stopped working, the whole thing will just fall apart and kind of crumble. And you kind of get a glimpse of that when... Hagrid gets stunned by a spell and he's like passed out and now that motorcycle's going all over the place and that's what essentially happens to our body when we don't have full contact with the floor or your shoes and you're not thinking about placing pressure in those three points things fall apart and it travels up the chain of command aka the rest of your body and you end up doing some weird looking stuff when you try to squat. Now, what can happen is, depending on where you're at with foot stability, foot strength, and just overall foot health, which is a whole other topic that we can get into, um, you might end up pronating or supinating the foot. And a lot of times what I've seen when people have poor squat mechanics and especially people that have knee pain, they tend to pronate their foot, meaning it collapses in. And, you know, people know the terminology of like a collapsed arch. They fall into their arches. Now, imagine if you have that, you know, three-wheeled motorcycle from Harry Potter and we just take off the front wheel, it's going to fall all over the place and be super floppy. So by pronating, like just if you're like watching at home, I have my hand straight out and my right hand. And now imagine you squatting with a perfectly flat palm like this. You'll be able to spread the floor. You'll be able to, you know, hold your balance. You'll be able to do a lot of things. But now imagine if I drove my big thumb down and in, already I'm feeling like torque on my wrist and it doesn't feel that good. Right Now imagine me placing a body on top and I squat like that. Most likely the inside of my ankle is going to take some ground to work, but also the inside of the knee is going to take a lot of the work. And over time, people are going to have painful knees. You know, And this happens in athletes a lot of times when they get knee pain, especially immediately. Um, 
and you ask them like, oh, what hurts the knee? What movements? And if they're a running athlete, for example, they're like, oh, when I run, it's fine. When I cut, when I whatever, it just doesn't hurt at all. But if I squat, single leg squat, I get pain right away. And that just tells me that in a loaded position, the knee is just taking the grunt of the work because the foot can't properly stabilize, right? And eventually that can travel up to the hips and cause even more issues. But the big thing here is to ensure that one, we don't have like a foot dysfunction. And I put that in air quotes because it's like the worst way to describe um, what's going on with someone's uh, feet. But sometimes our feet are just not um, strong enough or haven't been challenged enough to actually do its job. And I see this all the time when I teach my kin stretch class and we go into simple like foot intrinsic exercises where I literally just ask people, lift your big toe off the ground and put it back down without lifting all the other toes. And what happens? People can't do it. All their other toes come up or they physically don't move and they look at me like I'm crazy. They have, they're like, what do you mean lift my big toe up? And that already tells me that you know, their first point of contact when it comes to um, pressing off for a, a run or a lunge or something, they can't actually physically push down to activate all those muscles um, that are kind of laid into where that arch is. So like I was literally just doing it now, like as I'm pressing my brake going down this hill, I'm pushing with my big toe down and I feel my entire arch kind of activate right off the bat. If you can't do that, what's going to happen is that, yeah, your whole ankle is just going to pronate down and fall and collapse in. And now your knee is now going to take all that excessive uh, pressure. So really when it comes to squatting, lunging, running, everything, it comes from the bottom of your foot of how you're placing and distributing pressure. If you can't stabilize from the foot up 100% down the road, you're going to have an injury in the knee. And a lot of times too, like if you look at the stats of how many ACL and MCL surgeries are happening, especially in the States, and again, bigger population and a more athletic population, it's staggering. Like, And especially like young athletes that are expected to do so much in their careers it's a little scary so when I see a young athlete or a CrossFit athlete in the clinic and they got some knee pain going on we automatically look at what's going on with their feet and they usually have terrible sense of placing pressure in the right areas so an easy drill is to start using those foot intrinsic uh, exercises on the toes but also um, being able to get into a squat position where you physically feel your heel, your um, point of where your big toe joint is, and also where your pinky uh, toe joint is, and try to place pressure in those three points to evenly distribute your body weight, and then start descending into a squat, uh, like a body weight squat, to see if you can shy away from the pain and a lot of times when I coach a proper squat with those things in mind a lot of those issues just go away and now you know I kind of reprogrammed a simple little movement pattern and behavior that someone has adapted and eventually the pain goes away Sometimes it's that simple, but again, sometimes there's some underlying other issues that could be happening. But for the most part, it just comes down to finding um, pain-free movement behaviors. So many times people move in terrible ways, it becomes a habit, and that's all they know. And you have to just retrain the brain to do other um, 
pathways that are pain free. Now imagine your feet are just not cooperating. You're probably going to have to do a little bit more work. And this is where I kind of enjoy getting people training barefoot uh, at home, at the gym if they can, um, just to get a little bit more proprioception in the foot. And a lot of times people will find that they'll fatigue so quickly, like so quickly. And um, that being said, sometimes you can just start uh, a little bit slower and like say if your workouts are an hour, train barefoot for just a warm up that's like 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it is, and slowly build up so then eventually you can go a whole hour barefoot, right? I think I'm going to leave it there because I can like literally talk for another two hours about the foot. But the biggest takeaway on this is to imagine those three points of contact. Imagine you are hairy being chased by the Death Eaters and you're in that three little wheeled uh, motorcycle and you need to have those three points of contact in order to get away from the Death Eaters, a.k.a. pain (laughs) and a good looking squat. Well, you're not getting away from a good looking squat. You're going to achieve a good looking squat. Um, so the next time you're in the gym, try going barefoot or working out at home, try going barefoot in part of your warm up. go barefoot and try to distribute your weight on those three points as you do slow and controlled body weight squats to see and feel the difference and hundred percent that's going to improve your barbell back squat, your front squat, any kind of squat variation there is, and also get those feet a little bit stronger, and a little bit healthier, that will prevent any kind of injury. So that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for listening. You guys are so amazing. All the people around the world listening to my podcast, thank you, thank you, thank you. You don't understand how much it means to me to see people outside of where I live that listen to my show. Thank you so much. Um, hit the show notes, add me on Facebook, add me on Instagram. I post a lot of stuff. Um, give me a five star review wherever you're listening. You know, if it's Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher radio, Google play, whatever it is, please, please, please give me a five star review so I can reach more people. That's it for me. You guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are awesome. What's up my podcast listeners. This is your host for Fal Matuszewski. And we are doing another edition of my podcast on video because I've been getting a lot of better traction. People have been enjoying my longer episodes and videos, especially when it comes to exercise stuff where I can demonstrate. So today we're going to do quite a bit of demos. So if you are just listening in your car, at home, cleaning, whatever stuff you're doing. Um, I'm gonna be very, very descriptive so you can kind of get an idea, but I highly, highly recommend that you hit the show notes and watch the video Um, because today we're gonna go over um, proper squat technique and where a lot of people kind of screw up on their squat and where they could be limited. So I'm gonna be moving the camera around a lot to kind of showcase different body parts, some cues and body positions. Um, So that being said, um, hit the show notes, watch the video, highly recommend it. Um, Also that being said, I am trying to get 200 subscribers to my YouTube channel. I'm like 180 something. And I've been really pushing on my social media to get people subscribed because I post a lot of videos. So not only do you get to watch this and get a notification that, you know, oh, I uploaded a new thing. You also get to see all the new exercises I'll be uploading weekly. Like I tend to upload anywhere from like three to 10 um, per week. So 100% recommend subscribing to my YouTube channel. But anyway, um, the squat. So in this case, we obviously don't have a barbell because I don't have a barbell at my house, but we will kind of cover um, back squat form. But primarily I do um, quite a bit of squatting with clients 
um, in a gall lift position for a couple of reasons. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with this. So one, um, the barbell back squat in general requires a lot, I mean like a lot of prerequisites in order to do it um, effectively. And I would say 99% of the general population should not be barbell back squatting. They have no business doing so. I have yet to see a general population person do um, a good barbell back squat. Like even for me, like I move pretty well. My back squat's not that great. Like I'm pretty sure I could learn really, really, really well from a powerlifting coach, Olympic weightlifting coach. But even for me, like it's not the best lift that I do and it doesn't really transfer on other exercises or it doesn't really give me the benefit um you know long term for other things so um the goblet squat is kind of where i start with so many people and the number one thing is that putting a dumbbell in this position this goblet position um kind of self-corrects a lot of things because if you think about it if i was holding a dumbbell like this and squatting down it would probably not feel really good to collapse here. So automatically, your body just wants to self-correct and to be a more neutral position, more of a joint-centrated position, and things kind of just fall in place where they should. And say, you know, like, I'm not bashing back squats, it's just a lot can go wrong during a squat like that, and you need a lot in order to do that. And one of the prerequisites for strength I'm not gonna go into mobility yet for strength um, and I stole this from Dr. John Russin is the goblet squat challenge so you would take 50% of your body weight in a dumbbell kettlebell form whatever it is and you're gonna try to squat that weight 25 repetitions it's, that's fucking tough right so say you're a 200 pound person and you're holding a 100 pound dumbbell and you need to squat with good form 25 reps before you should start going into the barbell back squat like i think that in itself is one of those great ways to kind of gauge because like think about what is necessary in order to do a squat like that like that requires a lot of strength a lot of endurance a lot of core strength like a lot of the small foundational things that people tend to forget to develop and they jump right into the back squat rather than actually being able to do something like that. Like, fuck, if I took my half of my body weight and did 25 reps, I'd be like, fuck, like my legs are done, right? So sometimes, you know, I talk to people that are like kind of so set in their ways with fitness and health because one, I work at a gym where there's a lot of people that come in they do their thing they love the barbell back squat the barbell deadlift and then you know sometimes they'll ask me questions about the back squat and i take the time to like assess them look at them and i'm like honestly you shouldn't be back squatting and it's usually the same people that kind of hit a plateau or like something flares up every time they try to go heavy and they can't get past a certain thing and i'm like you should probably not be back squatting. You should probably scale it back, do some other stuff to kind of work through those um, deficiencies and then revisit. And they're like, mm, yeah. they're not really up for it. But, but like taking half of your body weight into a dumbbell and squatting and you realize that it's difficult. Why do you think placing a barbell on your back that's gonna have compressive forces and shear forces on your spine continually. And then on top of that, do form that's like mediocre. Like that's not gonna help you down the line or, or anything really. And then I always ask this question, I'm like, okay, well what's the goal behind you back squatting? Like, what are you trying to achieve? And a lot of times I just get a question, it's like, oh, I just wanna get strong legs and I'm like, well, there's so many other ways that you could get strong legs without barbell back squatting. So I think a lot of times people kind of um, just assume because you're using a barbell, it's like the pedestal of leg training exercises, but in reality, it's not. It's like, unless you're gonna be competing in powerlifting or um, what's it called? 
Olympic weightlifting, then you don't really need to do it. If the goal is to get strong legs, better looking legs, like there's so many other exercises out there that will um, do its job. And on top of that, not have so much of a taxing um, force on your body and, you know, do more harm than good. So that's kind of my thought process behind the barbell back squat. Because now let's get into what's needed, right? So not only do you need strength and core stability, hip stability, shoulder stability, all those things that kind of keep your body safe while doing the exercise, but there's a lot of mobility requirements. So number one is your thoracic mobility. If your T-spine, which is up here, can't effectively extend to place this barbell behind your back, then already you're fucked. <laughs> You're, you're already like doing it wrong. But if you look at the general population, like everyone has terrible T-spine mobility. And now they're thinking like, let's put a barbell on my back and hopefully, hopefully like nothing fucks up, but it does, it does. Um, so that's number one. Because when you think of, when you, I'm gonna try to tilt this down a little bit. Um, when you come down into your squat, let's say I have my barbell behind and I come down, like my torso needs to stay upright. So if I have a um, T-spine that doesn't really extend that great, I'm gonna kind of be here. So let's, t let's take that mobility that an average person has, and now I'm squatting down. Look at already what's happening with my spine, and look at my lumbar spine, like that does not look good. So this, this is literally where people kind of stop in their squat, they can do a quarter squat, and then if they go any lower, and I'm gonna tilt this a little bit further down to showcase this. So again, person with terrible T-spine mobility, they kind of here, they start squatting, and then they get to here. Like, that butt wink that people talk about happens a lot faster, and it's already starting to go into place, like, forces are going to places where they shouldn't, right? And I'm not saying, like, that rep that you just did is the one that's gonna destroy your spine, but it's the repetitive nature of it, right? Like, it's just like if someone's gonna go bend it down to pick up their kids or super rounded, it's not that one thing, it's like the repetitive motion of it. So that's one thing. In order to effectively back squat, to have the barbell in a biomechanically, like a biomechanically advantage position, you need T-spine mobility. So that's number one. Number two, shoulder mobility. So in order to take this barbell that's in front of you in the squat rack and place it behind you and effectively create tension, like that's the other thing too, is like when I talk to General Pop uh, about back squatting, the first question goes like, how do you create tension? And they're just like, they look at me like I'm speaking a different language, and I'm like, okay, if this person doesn't understand the concept of creating tension, creating intra-abdominal pressure in order to successfully like, go through this movement without energy leaks or, again, things going through places that are not supposed to, then they're already at a disadvantage. And on top of that, they're already with limited t by mobility. Like Things are now just spiraling out of control without them even knowing. So in order to create tension with a barbell on a back squat is if you were grabbing this guy and I have it behind my back and I'm pulling down into my traps. So the moment I pull down, like think of a lap pull down, like you're getting all this stuff to create tension for you, right? So if I now have terrible T-spine mobility and I'm trying to take the barbell, what's gonna happen is a lot like Perfect scenario is if I pull down, my elbows stay tight. And then this kind of tight position will get those lats engaged. But if I don't have T-spine or shoulder mobility, what happens is if I'm on a side view, what you'll see is these like chicken wing arms, like people's back squat tends to look like this, right? This is the typical position that everyone kind of falls into when they don't have those prerequisites. Now there's no way for you to create tension in that way. Um, just the design of like your shoulder being in this position trying to like pull down like it's not gonna happen. So now Let's move this camera down again 
Let's see, I am average Joe, back squatting, grab the barbell, I'm already in this rounded shoulder position, and I'm like this. Like, this is how the squat's going to look at a quarter, and then going any further, things again are starting to fall apart. Now, that was two things only. What do most general population people have? That's another issue. Tight hips. And you're trying to squat. If you have tight hips, it's not going to really happen. It's going to be like a square and around, a square peg in a round hole constantly trying to get through. So a lot of people end up doing quarter squats and they're just like jamming their um, femur into their hip uh, socket and you're just like grinding shit in places that it shouldn't be in. And what happens then is people almost kind of go into this like good morning type of squat with their upper torso, big rounded, and things are just getting worse now. The th fourth thing you need Actually, I'm going to go back to the third thing with the hips. So what happens is that if your hip joints don't move the way they should, your body's going to find mobility elsewhere. And it's usually a place that doesn't need to be mobile, a.k.a. your lower back. So what happens is your lower back takes over for the um, lack there of hip mobility. And now the low back has now starting to act like a mobile joint and over time that lower back's not going to be happy so that's one of the biggest things you see this in deadlifts and squats but one of the biggest complaints is low back pain and on top of that the same person that we're describing also doesn't really have a lot of t-spine mobility go to any good physio or chiro what happens is that people with low back pain they um, assess their T-spine mobility and hip mobility, they usually have zero. And then they're like, yeah, no wonder your low back hurts when this thing can't move and your hips can't move. Your low back's doing everything for you. <laughs> now, number four, tibial rotation. Now I'm gonna bring the camera down because this takes a little bit of visual, visual I can't speak today, um, like a visual. So. If you, I'm gonna tilt this guy down a little bit. I need a better tripod to do stuff. So, and I do this in my kin stretch class all the time and people don't really understand and I need to click my camera because I'm super white and like the camera is light. There you go. Um, so your tibia, which is this giant bone in your shin, when you squat, it needs to be able to externally rotate. So your knee joint, where you have your bone that literally goes in there, it allows it to rotate. And so this is my right side, so I can rotate to the right. So in my kin stretch class, when we do knee cars, I'm literally trying to get people to think about, you know, if I lock out my ankle, so now I'm not using my ankle joint like I'm doing ankle circles or anything like that. If I lock it out and try to rotate my foot to the right as far as possible this just moved so if you look at my shin I'm literally going to external rotation and I can also go to internal rotation a little bit so back and forth this tibia gets to move so if I literally like pinpoint my tibia and I squeeze down on my hand and I start rotating my foot out and you can see where my thumb is pointing is actually rotating to the right. This is a normal um, amount of tibial rotation for somebody. A lot of times when people are trying to squat and they're having a rough time getting down there, usually when, you, when I assess the person's tibia, they can't rotate this guy properly. So what happens is now again, shear forces are going to places where it shouldn't because like, having adequate tibial rotation allows you to kind of disperse force through it. And if that doesn't happen, it kind of gets stuck in the hip and people start getting painful, um, uh, a painful hip joint because it's taking up all the, the work. So one, that's number four is if this tibia can't move properly, then it's not, you're not ever going to squat the greatest, right? So a lot of times like, People just need to go back to the basics. And this is where, you know, my new joke now is like, hey, I have this 
thing in my body, it's my knee, my ankle, my wrist, my elbow, my shoulder, my hip, whatever joint, whatever muscle it is, they're like, what should I do? I'm like, fucking kin stretch. Like, kin stretch will literally fix everything because we need to influence tissue change at a joint or at a certain muscle that's not moving the way it should. So let's influence better tissues, better, like smarter tissue, right? So literally, um, kin stretch can fix all that. Now, the other component to squatting effectively is your ankle joint. I've literally done um, an entire episode about the ankle before, but essentially this ankle needs to have adequate dorsiflexion. So if I drive my knee forward, it needs to go pretty far, I'm gonna kind of move my arm, in order for me to squat. A lot of people have tight ankles and they get to a certain point, they get stuck, and now they can't effectively um, squat in their back squat, goblet squat, whatever it is, and things kind of fall apart. So that being said, we have now, what we said, T-spine, um, shoulder, hip, tibia, and ankle, five things. Five things in order to effectively um, squat. And most of the time when I get people um, working with me and I assess them, all five things don't move the way they should. And then they're complaining that they're getting pain in X, Y, and Z when they back squat. And I'm like, well, no wonder, <laughs> right? Like that makes sense to me. But for some reason, a lot of people feel like downgraded when I take them off back squatting or I suggest that. And I'm like, no, like you literally said the goal of the back squat for you is to get stronger legs or better looking legs. You don't have to back squat in order to do that. There's so many other ways. So I try to make the compromise of let's um, gobble squat heavy to supplement that back squat. Number one, when I convince them, um, right away they see a huge change in how they jo how their joints feel, and it's almost like a relief on like, oh great, I don't have to put a barbell on my back and like go through it and kind of feel not the greatest the next day. So the goblet squat is one of those things that I always move to, and there's lots of ways to make it challenging. So say you're, if you're a gym bro, that's been back squatting forever, but it's been effing up your body and you're like at that point where like, okay, I will do your goblet squat. And I always make this joke slash statement, like I can take the strongest guy at our gym, give him the 100 pound dumbbell in a goblet position and tell him for five reps, you're gonna goblet squat. But what I wanna see is you're gonna eccentrically load, so going down slowly for five Mississippis. And then at the bottom of your squat, you're gonna hold it for another five Mississippis, and then when you go up, I want you to go as fast as possible, and that's one rep. Do four more after. That will destroy him, destroy that guy, and that's when I can convince people that, holy shit, this is a lot harder than slapping 225, doing quarter squats with terrible biomechanics. Like, you're gonna get more out of that than forcing a square peg in a round hole constantly right i just don't understand people not getting there without me like proving to them that their body doesn't move the way it should and then showcasing another strategy for them to progress at their gym career and that also helps like we talked about this whole concept of like time after attention like movements that burn more calories and Everyone that's listening, everyone that goes to the gym is trying to burn more calories to, you know, build more muscle, shed more fat. The goblet squat, that example I just gave, is going to help. That's going to get you there compared to slapping the barbell on your back and doing it like one fourth of what it's supposed to look like. So let's move on because I can go on that topic forever. Um, we're going to go into how I coach the goblet squat and what I want to see. So let's move the camera so then you can see me squat it out. Now, let me move this. 
I feel like I need a better camera setup. Okay, so with the goblet squat, typically, and this goes down to anatomy too, everyone's hips are different. And I always have this discussion with everyone. But typically, a more narrow stance with your heels and a more outwardly rotated um, forefoot with the knees tracking over it tends to work better for most people compared to like, oh, hip width apart, toes straight, whatever it is. So when I get people squatting, like I said, a more narrow stance, closer with the heels, with the toes out, with the knees tracking on the outside. It tends to work a little bit better. Why? Most general population, can't speak, population people, um, their hips have adapted to their sitting quite a bit. And in my experience in the gym and clinic, that squat stance tends to work a lot. Now there are different squat assessments, and again, stealing it from Dr. John Russin, where you can measure about um, like three or four different points on uh, the body to figure out what their best uh, squat stance is. Uh, but we're not gonna get into that today, but generally speaking, that's what tends to work. So, in that squat position, a more narrow stance with the heels. Hope you can see that, yeah toes out a little bit more and this is the thing is I want people to think of having their knees constantly follow where the toes are and that's going to engage all these hips uh, hip lateral stabilizers in the squat because the worst thing is when people start squatting and their knees kind of buckle in and then they come back up and that's another reason why I don't like um, having the toes forward which a lot of people tend to fall into that category because that's what they were told but if you're that person that has limited ankle mobility and tibial rotation, that's not gonna help. And you're gonna end up looking like this in your squat. And that's like a deadlift, we don't want a deadlift. So if you think about it, if you're that person with tight ankles and tight um, and limited range of motion in your tibia, then this position here where one, you're tracking your knees out, which is gonna already allow your tibia to go out. You're pushing your knees out, which is gonna externally rotate your hips to give you more mobility because a lot of people lack internal rotation um, and now you're also allowing to utilize more of a vertical shin angle which requires less of dorsiflexion so we're covering already three things for a better squat of the five that we spoke earlier and this is why it tends to work a lot so now in that goblet position with that foot position that we're in, and we're squatting to about parallel, whatever you can do. And if I'm holding a dumbbell here, now, like I was talking about earlier, how it's more of a um, self-correcting exercise, it teaches you how to extend through the spine. And now we don't have to worry about um, shoulder mobility to get that barbell behind our back. So now we've literally covered all five issues in what we spoke about earlier to get that squat looking better. Now that we are biomechanically at an advantage with all those things, boom, we're good to go. Let's load and now let's fuck some shit up. That's what I always say. And the other things too, to create that tension, right? It all kind of starts with your feet. So if you think of like a ground up approach, when I'm getting people to um, squat, as they're pushing their knees out, I'm trying to push their feet out without like rolling their ankle over. So the moment, like even if you stand and you just think about, I'm gonna push my feet out, you feel these lateral stabilizers turn on right away. You're creating tension. So if I'm doing that position and pushing out, I'm creating a lot of good tension. And as I'm coming down in my squat, I'm taking a big intro abdominal uh, breath in my belly. So if I took a deep breath in, big round belly and hold as I come down and then I'm exhaling as hard as possible and then locking out my glutes at the top. And then the other way to create tension that I really, really, really like is utilizing the um, piece of equipment. So if I'm holding the dumbbell, I'm thinking of like 
squeezing that thing and also hiding the armpits. What do I mean by that? is a lot of times when people go into goblet position, they're kind of already in this round position. But if I tell you to hide your armpits, people fall into this position. Now I'm kind of packing that shoulder, getting my lats engaged, and I have a better um, way to create tension. So now I have tension creating in my feet, in my knees, in my hips, in my core, in my hands. And I'm also doing that into getting into more T-spine extension and better uh, shoulder stability. So five biomechan biomechanical advantages already covered. We've already created tension. We already covered our breath, like fucking load it now, right? Again, these are a lot of th things to remember and it can be overwhelming for someone new, but these are the things that I slowly start implementing one thing at a time. So then when we do get to a point with my client where I'm like, okay, here's the 60 pound dumbbell they're ready, they're well equipped, and they can fucking crush it. They do their first set, and then they're like, crap, I can't believe I did that. And I'm like, yeah, we freaking worked up to it, right? So it's those small things that add up over time. But a lot of people always wanna skip. They always wanna skip steps, I don't understand. That's like you trying to bake something, and you're like, fuck step three, I'm just gonna go to step number five, put this bitch in the oven, and hopefully it turns out. Like, no. Like everyone knows that's so stupid, but in exercise for some reason, it's like, no, I don't need to do dumbbell squats. I'm just gonna go right to the barbell because everyone else is doing it and it looks fucking cool. Like, no, because at the end of the day, we all wanna move better, feel better and get stronger. Like you gotta match up the exercises to your goals. So I'm gonna leave it there because I know that I could probably go for another hour on this, but this gave you a lot of information a lot of visual cues, a lot of things to think about when you're squatting, and hopefully I convince you to actually stop back squatting a little bit. I've literally done this with CrossFitters that are literally in chronic pain when they squat, and I convince them like, fuck, for one month, stop back squatting. Stop putting a barbell on your back and just goblet squat, and tell me how you feel. And like, that's the one thing. Every single one of them, they feel so much better. And then they go, you know what? Maybe I need to look at my ankles, my tibia, my hips, my T-spine, my shoulders. There you have it. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, hit the show notes, watch this video, subscribe to my channel so then you get updates anytime I post a new one. Um, also add me on Facebook and Instagram because I post again a lot of videos and photos and things like that of a lot of content. And please reach out, like, I post a lot of stuff. I love answering questions. I'm getting a lot of rehab-specific questions right now. And for those who don't know, who are like, I just found you, Raph, like, you're pretty good at what you do. I've been working at a chiropractic clinic for three years now, working with almost every single patient coming in. I have seen a lot of injuries. I have worked with a lot of injuries. I've worked on some really weird cases and applied my knowledge of exercise for these people. And I've seen great results, both on the manual therapy side and on the exercise therapy, ser therapy side, blending together. And I can definitely, definitely help you if you are frustrated, because I we get a lot of patients that have been seeing physio or chiro for two years from a car accident, and nothing's getting better, and they come see us and they're like, holy shit, why didn't I do this in the very beginning? So feel free to reach out if you're like, yeah, so my shoulder thing, and I had surgery and it didn't really heal. Like I have ideas that can help. And if not, I can refer you to someone in the industry because I have quite a big extensive network across the world as great strength coaches and practitioners that can help. So feel free to reach out. That's it for me. Till next time, you guys.